Hello, and once again, welcome to a Sunday morning Bible study. I'm your host, Chris Short, and I recognize that some of you do indeed see this presentation on a Sunday morning. Others view it Saturday afternoon, usually when I get it recorded. Uh, still others see it later in the week. It doesn't matter when you, rec when you happen to take time to view it. I just want you to know that I consider it an honor to have you join us for our, our look into the words of God, our look into the Bible, our look at some of the times and places, some of the people that are recorded there. Because I'm firmly convinced that there's a message for us today, even in writings that are some 2,000 years old. Those messages are the ones that, are, that uh, Jesus Christ intended to, to lead our lives, the ones that he intended for us to follow so that we might have a better life here on this earth and the promise of an eternal life with him in, in heaven. I'm privileged to be able to uh, take the time to have God guide me in my study of those words and, and find the, the words and images that I hope are somehow meaningful to you. Uh, this week, I've entitled our message, Hero, Martyr, Christian, as we look at a man who, who could be regarded as one of all of those three but a man who, most importantly, was simply a Christian, trying to do what, what he believed was best, to follow his Savior. Before we begin, would you pray with me, please? Our dear Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you this day, just thankful for the opportunity we have to live in a country that allows us the freedom to gather together, even though it might be virtually, to gather together and to read in your word, a privilege that is not allowed in many countries, to gather together reading your word in a Bible that each of us is privileged to own. Again, a freedom that's not allowed in many countries. Thank you, Father, for giving us that, that word. Thank you for giving us that book. Thank you for giving us those freedoms. We recognize, Father, that we still leave, live in a blessed land despite the the upheavals and the disturbances that are taking place currently. And we just ask, Father, that you might continue to bless us. Bless us in all the ways that you have blessed us in the days of the past, and we appreciate those. Bless us with the blessings you hold for us to experience yet today. And particularly, Father, we thank you for the blessings that you hold in store for us tomorrow and the tomorrows to follow after that. We recognize, Father, that as sinners we probably don't deserve those blessings but we were granted the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth to die for us so that we might live for him. Thank you, Father, for all of our blessings, particularly, particularly for the blessing of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In our lifetimes, each of us has probably been a member of a group that was considered unpopular, or we have supported a group that was unpopular or an activity or a cause that was unpopular. Sometimes that support is harmless. Sometimes belonging to a group such as that is, is difficult. It causes you to be looked down upon. Sometimes belonging to such a group is, is even fateful. In my time, uh, as I was growing up and in high school at Jordan High School in Sandy, Utah, a school that was known as the Beat Diggers, the people that received the most popularity, the people that received the most recognition were the, the student athletes. And, and I suppose in, in many ways uh, that was okay. The, they were successful. They represented our school well. I wasn't an athlete. I was more involved in forensics and debate. And not that we weren't successful. Uh, our school drama group had won the state championship five years in a row, and, and we had successful debaters and orators and so on. We just weren't as popular as the athletes. It, it isn't easy for someone to support unpopular groups, even though they may be athletes. Ask anyone who, who had been a supporter of the Chicago Cubs for any number of years prior to their actually winning the World Series in, in 2016. Or... You might have been, if you're a football fan, a supporter of the Cleveland Browns 
a group that's coming to town this weekend, the weekend of January 16th, 2021, to play our own Kansas City Chiefs in an attempt to see who, who moves forward, heading towards what will eventually be the Super Bowl. Well, those are harmless groups to support. In biblical times, one of the worst groups to support, one of the most difficult groups to support, was the group known as Christians, the people of the way. The followers of the church, the leaders of the church at that time, were attempting to walk in the footsteps of their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they were members of an unpopular group. You may recall a few weeks ago we looked at the activities of, of two of that group, two of the twelve, Peter and John, who were able to, to utilize the power that was granted to them by the Son of God to, to heal a man who, at, who sat daily at the gateway into the temple, begging for sufficient income to provide for his living. This man was unable to walk from the time of his birth, and with the power of God working through them with the Holy Spirit, Peter and John were able to heal him so that he not only walked, but was able to accompany them into the temple and to astonish his fellow countrymen. We may have thought that that demonstration would be sufficient to, to help convince even the hardest of skeptics that following the way of Christ, following the, the church of the way, was indeed the thing to do if they wanted to have a, a better life here on earth and, and if they wanted to experience the promises the Savior had made them for an eternal life, a, a life that would promise a forgiveness of sin and, and moral failures. But that isn't what happened. Instead of being seen as bearers of great power granted by God and his son Jesus Christ, Peter and John were arrested. We read the details of the incident in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. It tells us this. Now, Peter and John were arrested and they were taken to the Sanhedrin. And chapter 4 of Acts, verses 1 through 4, gives us these words. As they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees, they came upon them. They were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. Now, we should obviously be encouraged by the fact that, that 5,000 men, plus, of course, the uncounted women of the Bible, were added to the ever-increasing numbers of those who, who chose to become believers, who chose to become followers, who chose to become future recipients of the promises of Jesus. Having been arrested, Peter and John were kept overnight to await their appearance before the those who would, would pass judgment on their behavior. Can we take a moment just to, to look at the, the makeup of that particular group? The Bible tells us in Acts 4, uh, verses 5 and 6, it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together in Jerusalem. I find this description one we probably shouldn't overlook. Annas, of course, was the former high priest who had been deposed by the Romans, even though they had originally appointed him. Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, was the current high priest. And John is believed to be another one of the, John and Alexander are believed to be uh, other sons of the uh, former high priest Annas. The Bible says that as many of the family as possible of Annas were gathered there in that place. Now, if that description of the, the gathering that was there sounds familiar to you, I think it should. If you recall our message from Sunday, October 25th of 2020, we talked about the arrest and the trial of Jesus Christ. And you may recall me pointing out this. The membership in the Sanhedrin was normally 71, but on the night they tried Jesus, there was barely a quorum of 23. Almost all of those present were related to Annas. Five were sons, one was a son-in-law, and others were, 
were, according to Jewish tradition and history, were said to be cousins. Do you see what I'm seeing? Not, not only was Caiaphas the one who'd issued the, the edict that it would be good for Jesus to die present, but he was a member of the family of Annas who had lost income, who had lost prestige, who had lost face by the appearance of Jesus. Just prior to this incident, Jesus had cleansed the temple of the money changers, of the, of the buyers, of the sellers who were waiting there to, to sell their ware to people who had come. And those sellers were there because Annas had permitted them to be there, there in the temple courtyard, selling their goods, their, their doves, their sheep, their oxen, whatever they were selling for people to sacrifice. It was Annas who had lost money. It was Annas who had lost prestige. It was Annas who had lost position. Of course, we know the outcome of that arrest, that, that illegal trial, and, and the ensuing crucifixion of Jesus. From our point of view, it was the beginning of a, a series of events that resulted in the, the formation of the church, which would eventually become known as Christians, the followers of Jesus. From the point of view of Annas and his family, the death of Jesus was putting an end to this, this so-called new king who would come and, and take from them the power that the Romans had granted to them. They thought they had ended all of this, but they hadn't counted on the, the newfound ability of others who would come and, and speak on behalf of Jesus. They hadn't counted on the ability of Peter when he was brought before the courts, when he was threatened to speak out and boldly proclaim that he was a Christian and let them tell their why. Uh, Peter had initially, if you recall, denied Christ three times on the, the morning that he was brought to, to the trial. And he stammered, he, he, was, he was unsure of himself at that time. But since that time, since the day of Pentecost, Peter had become the leader of the church. And so he spoke out and because they were unable to, to contradict what Peter and John were saying, and because the man he, they had healed from lameness was standing there next to them, the council couldn't deny what they had done. And so they let them go. But they warned them, do not continue to preach in the name of Jesus. Do not continue to, to speak out in the name of Jesus. And of course, we, we know that Peter refused to listen to them. He continued to preach. He continued to speak out. But now there was another. There was, there was another that was, was speaking out on, on behalf of, of Jesus that was uh, seen as dangerous, seen as uh, costly to, the, to those. And if you recall, the, the church at that time was exercising a sort of uh, Christian socialism, if you will. They, they had... Uh, the ones who could supplied the means for support and living to those who couldn't. And they were being successful. The church was growing. And that brings us to a story of the man we want to look at today. His name is Stephen, although probably his name should be pronounced Stephen. The, he was a Greek, uh, and Stephen, or Stephen, comes from the Greek word Stephanos, uh, which would lead us to believe Stephen would be the correct pronunciation. But over time, over history, and over Englishization of that word, we've come to recognize the spelling of S-T-E-P-H-E-N as Stephen, just as we would pronounce the word S-T-E-V-E-N. So, we're introduced to Stephen. Uh, you recall the, the story of how the, the word of the, the people of the way were, was being enforced at that time. They were, they were giving what they could to help support each other. In fact, you may recall the story of a man called Barnabas who had some property that he sold. And after he sold that property, he gave the money to the apostles so they could buy whatever was needed, so they could divide up whatever was needed among the less fortunate in the Christian group. Although at that time they still weren't called Christians. That didn't happen until the church was at Antioch. Uh, at this time they were still just known as people of the way. And you might recall the story we talked about last week, the two biggest liars, uh, Annas, or Ananias and Sapphira, 
who, wanting to be recognized and, and loved as, as Barnabas had been, sold property of their own, and then because they lied to Peter and the church and consequently to God about how much they had actually made and how much they gave to the church, they suffered their own deaths. So when this was happening, there was one group who felt they weren't being treated fairly. These were the, the Hellenists. The, the Hellenists were, were uh, Greek people. Uh, they were Jewish born, Jewish ancestry, but they lived in Greece, so they were from Greece. And as such, they'd learned Greek culture, Greek history, and they, and they spoke Greek. And this particular group, as they came to be members of the way, felt they weren't being treated quite as, as fairly as the other members because they were basically outsiders. The, the 12 agreed that they were perhaps being neglected in their duties and, and recognized that just with 12 of them, they simply weren't able to take care of all the distribution of food and supplies as should be necessary. And so they decided that they should appoint others to, to help with that distribution. And they appointed seven, seven who became the, the first deacons of the church. Those seven were men called Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, and Stephen, or Stephen. All were Hellenists, all were Greek speakers, and collectively they became the first deacons of the new church. And although he was just one of seven men chosen to make sure that food and supplies were fairly distributed to the, the Grecian widows, Stephen soon began to stand out. If you're a regular member of my Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington, Missouri, I'd ask you to turn to page 67 in your lesson manuals. For those of you who are following along in your own Bibles, we're going to begin in the book of Acts, chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 8, which reads, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and great signs among the people. Now, exactly what those signs, those wonders, those perhaps miracles were, we're not told. But we do know that Stephen was empowered to perform them by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that had been granted to him by his Savior. Uh, Stephen had the, the gifts, the boldness, and the brilliance to be a, a powerful witness for Jesus, for believers, for the new and, and growing church. However, his witness, while received warmly by believers, wasn't welcome by those who were in opposition to this, this growing church. Only God can open the hearts of those who, are, who aren't swayed by, by our gifts, by our boldness, by whatever brilliance we might possess. So Acts uh, chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 tells us this. Then there arose from some from what is called the synagogue of the, the freedmen, who are believed to be Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia. They arose disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Scholars believe these men were, were freed slaves who came from those areas mentioned, and they gathered in the synagogue to, to discuss scripture, to discuss what they believed. And when Stephen came along and, and started preaching Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins and the eternal life, that he was the one who had been promised by the, the scriptures, the one who had been uh, foretold by the prophets, he wasn't greeted warmly. And these, these Jewish men found uh, Stephen's words to be something threatening, something that, that threatened their long-held religious beliefs, and perhaps it meant that if Christianity was more than, than just another Jewish sect, this could be something different, an entirely new covenant with God, and a covenant which would replace the old. And even though these men argued with, with Stephen, they were unable to, to counter his arguments. He was, he was just too good, too bright, too, too empowered by the, the Spirit that they were able to, to argue with him successfully. And so uh, Acts 11, 6, 11 tells us, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words 
against Moses and God. The same, the, the result of, of Stephen's message in the synagogue resulted in the arrest of Stephen. And once again, a man of God was taken before the Sanhedrin, the same Jewish council that had condemned Jesus to death, the same Jewish council that had attempted to put an end to the preaching of Peter and John. Here, those who had spoken false testimony against Stephen, leading to his arrest, spoke against him, saying this, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place on the law. For, excuse me, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. We should note that the high priest who was by all accounts at this time the same Caiaphas that had presided at the trial of Jesus. He was, however, willing to give Stephen an opportunity to speak. Acts 7.1 tells us, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Now, if Caiaphas hoped perhaps Stephen would, would bow before the accusations of the false witnesses or, or perhaps plead for mercy from the council, he was to be severely disappointed. Stephen spoke, and in that speaking, he reiterated the stories from Jewish history that all who were listening were familiar with. He praised the Lord his God, and then he ended with a soliloquy that had a stinging accusation. Page 68 for my regular class members, where the manual doesn't record the, well, it records the final word of Stephen's speech, but it doesn't record all the words that are, that are in there, because they're there are 43 additional verses that are not written there where Stephen recounted Jewish history, where Stephen pointed out the failures of the Jewish people under the leadership of Moses, who they all revered. And then Stephen went on to, to point out, as his speaking due to a close, uh, the reign of David and his son Solomon and the folly of men who didn't listen to the words of God who didn't listen to the words of his son, Jesus Christ, who in their, their ignorance had acted exactly as those who wandered in the wilderness and those who incorrectly assumed they would always have God on their side by simply building earthly structures which unfortunately were failingly designed to reward the God who had created everything. Let me go to Acts 7, uh, Acts 7 verse uh, 44. Stephen said this, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the patterns that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers, the days of David who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, however, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, says Stephen. As the prophet says, and then he quoted from the, the prophet Isaiah, who was almost as revered as Moses among the people, it was Isaiah who repeated God's words when he said, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? And then he followed with the, the accusation against the council and those who were listening. Acts 23, Acts 7, verses 51 and the first part of 52, Stephen said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Now, I can admire, uh, imagine the, the ire of the, the crowd and the people listening, building from a, a point of mere disgust and hatred of Stephen speaking of Christ, to the point of, of anger, 
loathing and, and self-incrimination. And they were getting to the straining point. They were, they were straining to the breaking point. But Stephen wasn't done yet. He went on. He pointed out, And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received by the, the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Stephen was using language even more bold, more accusatory, and more honest than even Peter had spoken to them. And Peter had been released with a, a mere warning. A warning would not be sufficient for Stephen. Page 69 for my class, the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 54 and following for the rest of us. Stephen had preached a, an impassioned defense of Christianity, but his words fell on ears of those who were, were deaf to the truth. They were not ready, as it was, and, and it's been repeated many times in the Old and New Testament, six times alone in the, the Gospels, and, and then again in Revelation. He who has ears, let him hear. These are people who, who didn't want to hear, who didn't want to know. This was a hard-hearted people. This was a, a stiff-necked people. This was a people already feeling guilty about the way they had treated the one whom the prophets had foretold. They had seen the miracles of Jesus. They had seen Jesus crucified. They had seen, many of them, and if they hadn't seen it, at least heard, the words of those who saw Jesus resurrected. They recognized that they were implicit in their part this angered them so much they, they still didn't want the people of God to succeed and something had to be done. Their frustration, their anger, their guilt couldn't be contained and they acted. Verse 54 of chapter 7 of Acts tells us, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Can you see in your, your mind's eye just how aroused with frustration, anger, and, and guilt those who are listening must have been? At, at this point, they were, they were almost incensed with anger, almost couldn't control themselves. They wanted Stephen to be quiet. But Stephen went on. He went a step further. Blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, he was allowed to actually see into heaven. And in doing so, he announced, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen at this point was the only one in the Bible who, except Jesus himself, who refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. Perhaps it was a, a final statement indicating to those who are listening that there, but for the grace of God, was Jesus and that he really wasn't that much different than any of them. That was the final straw. The crowd reacted, and they reacted badly. Verse 57 in the first part of verse 58 tells us, Then they crowd out with, cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears, and they ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. Even then... In the spirit of his Savior, in the assurances that the Savior had given him, in the faith that he possessed, Stephen repeated the words that his Savior had repeated as the Holy One faced his own mortal death. Verses 59 and 60. As they stoned Stephen, he was calling on God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then kneeling down, he cried out loudly, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And so the, the story of Stephen comes to a close. The story of one of the first deacons comes to a close. The story of the first martyr of Christendom comes to a close. Some of you, however, may have noticed that I I left something out of that story. 
I quoted from the first part of verse 58 that dealt with the stoning of Jesus, but I didn't finish that verse, and it's important that I do so. It reads like this, And the witnesses to the stoning laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so the Bible introduces us to the man who would become one of the greatest voices of all time for the cause of Jesus Christ. A man who, throughout his own life, chose to be a member of an unpopular group of, as the world viewed it at that time. A man who wrote most of the New Testament as a witness to those of us who chose today to follow that risen Savior. A man who wrote and who, remember, who we remember as Paul. In our acceptance of Stephen's Savior, Paul's Savior, we find ourselves as Christians increasingly under attack by those who still refuse to accept, those who still refuse to believe that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God. And they refuse still to acknowledge that he came for the reason that he said he did, to save mankind from themselves. That's the message. That's the message we've been commanded to spread to the world. The message that contains the, the promises of Jesus, the assurance of Jesus, the confirmation of Jesus that brings us to the confirmation that it brought to Stephen the hero, the martyr, the Christian. That's the message that we are commanded to, to go to others and to, to present to them. And I know it's difficult. Being a Christian in these times is, is unpopular. Speaking the words of Christ to those who still don't have ears to hear makes it difficult for them to accept us as as friends, as neighbors, as co-workers. But the message is so important that we must speak it out. We cannot allow it to, to remain unsaid. We cannot re allow it to remain unspoken. We cannot allow it to remain unshared. And some of you will say, I, I just don't know enough. I, I'm just not brave enough. Well, you see, you know what you know, and that is enough. That's enough for you to start that conversation. It's enough for you to bear your testimony. It's enough for you to tell of the works of Jesus Christ and the promises of Jesus Christ. You have that message and you have the command of Jesus to go. And how do we do that? We're, well, we're not going to be blessed as the, the 12 were at the day of Pentecost where they, they stood and were able to preach to, to hundreds or even thousands of people in their own language. But we are blessed daily, weekly, monthly, I don't know, with the opportunity to have at least one who will stand in front of us who does not know that message, who perhaps doesn't know who Jesus Christ was or, or knowing has never heard his message well enough that they understand it. And so my desire for you, my suggestion for you is that this year, each of you find one person a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, a person who perhaps knows who Jesus was but hasn't heard the message or having heard the message doesn't understand it. I'd ask that each one of you serve one of them and serve them in his name because the blessings of Jesus Christ, the promises of God are too great to ignore. They were written in that book some 2,000 years ago so that we would have them today, so that we could share them today, so that we could give to others the gift that has been given to us, a gift of salvation, a gift of forgiveness of sins, forgiveness of our shortcomings, forgiveness of our failures, and the promises of an eternal life in a heaven, in a mansion that Jesus went ahead of us to prepare. That's what we're supposed to do. Pretty simple, really. Stephen died for that. Paul died for that. The twelve died for that. We're not being asked to die. We're simply being asked to share. Can't we do that? Pray with me, please. Our dear Father in heaven, 
we come before you this morning to to look at a man who may be considered the first martyr of the Christian faith a man who may be considered a hero for dying for his faith but a man that we we have come to realize was no different than any of the rest of us he was simply a Christian simply one who who attempted to follow in the footsteps of your son thank you father for Stephen's story and thank you for introducing us to Paul who at that time was still known as Saul of Tarsus thank you father for those words that we find in the New Testament the words that start in the Gospels to support our faith that continue in Acts continue in Romans to demonstrate just how strong and powerful the Word of God was in relation to those people and thank you father for the histories that were written by Paul that explain to us how the church grew how it should be managed how it should function bless us father that we as individual members of our churches whatever they are wherever they are might continue to take those words into our hearts that we might continue to be the Christians you would have us be thank you father for our blessings those of yesterday those of today and those of tomorrow and please father allow us our greatest blessing to be able to be confronted by one who does not yet know that message and father grant us the boldness the bravery the conviction that was Stephen's that was Paul's and allow us to speak again the message of your son in whose name we always pray amen thank you for being with us again I look forward to seeing you even though it's metaphorically and and only virtually in coming weeks as we continue to look at the the words of the Savior as they were expressed by the early churches as they were expanded by the early churches as they grew into the movement that became the church at, at uh, that was to be known as Christians the churches the people the places that led to us being the Christians of today a people blessed beyond what we deserve thanks again for being there I look forward to seeing you again I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Please always feel free to contact me if you have questions, if you have comments. I appreciate it. Have a great day, a wonderful week, and may God bless you always.